Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. This program is dedicated to bringing you relevant insight into the biblical text that pertains to our time. Here is Dr. Woodhead with today's Bible teaching. The name Zechariah comes from a Hebrew word uh, that is Zechariah, but the Hebrew word comes from a verb, zakar, and it means, it means to remember. So the Hebrew word for remember is zakar. And then the last half of the word is a truncated word for God, Yahweh. So they just have yah, uh, zakar, yah. God remembers. And, and it's a fitting name here because it's a discussion of God remembering Israel. And at the time this was written, it was right near the end of what we call the exile or the Babylonian captivity. And uh, this is a real common name in the Bible. It's found about 43 times and it's over 20 different people have been given this name. But this guy is very, very special. He was given these prophecies about 520 B.C., and uh, the prophecies range from the end of the uh, exile all the way through to the second coming uh, of Jesus uh, of Nazareth. Although his name is not given here as Jesus, it's given as the branch and several other names that we'll explore as uh, we move through this book. It's, uh, it's been viewed as the apocalypse of the Old Testament because it's just filled with vivid imagery about what's yet future to us and some have called it a continuation of Daniel the prophet because there's so much information about the times of the Gentiles. This guy was born in Babylon. He was, as his father and grandfather, a priest and a prophet just like Ezekiel and Daniel. He was a contemporary of a man named Haggai. Haggai's book is very, very small and it appears just before Zechariah in what we call the Minor Prophets, which is the last segment of the uh, prophetic books just before the New Testament starts. They're only minor in the, fa in the sense that the, the books are actually small. And this is the largest of the contemporary, or excuse me, of the Minor Prophets. Haggai was a much older man than Zechariah. Zechariah was probably born in the exile because he was a young man here. But Haggai was, um, he was alive in uh, Israel before the Babylonians came in and uh, captured them. And Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian general and king, came in in 605. He came back in 597 and then finally came back in 586 BC and he just leveled Jerusalem. And he destroyed the temple, and each time he carried away a substantial number of the Israelites and took them back to Babylon. In the first invasion, he took Daniel in 605 B.C., and we know from the book of Daniel and uh, some other sources that Daniel um, was elevated, almost like Joseph, to become second only to the king. He was a prime minister. Uh, through two successive administrations too. Uh, the Medes and the Persians conquered Babylon and so he uh, continued in favor there. Um, and then um, Ezekiel was carried away in 597 and, um, and then in 586 Nebuchadnezzar came in and he just leveled everything. Just everything. Now the Babylonians were conquered by a group called the Medes and the Persians that was an amalgamation of two different people groups that had come together at the time that Babylon was in existence. And um, one of its earliest people that was ruling it was a guy named Cyrus. And what Cyrus did in 539 BC was he granted the Jews the right to go back to Israel and rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild their temple. <clears throat> and there were several people that went back. Uh, Ze Zechariah was one of them. Now, they went back um, sometime in the area of about 536 to uh, 535. 
And in 530 BC, remember BC, the numbers get smaller the closer you get to the future. Um, Cyrus died and he was succeeded by Cambyses II, who was his son. And then Darius the first was the person that succeeded Cambyses II in 522 BC. And it was during Darius's reign that these prophecies were given. Now Daniel was alive at the same time. Because we read about an event about Daniel being in this lion's den. And that was at the time of Darius's reign. And I put a map, an ancient map down in your notes there. And the greenish yellow is uh, the Medo-Persian Empire as it finally developed in its uh, form just before it was taken over by Alexander. Verse 1, uh, Zechariah 1.1, 1, 1, the text begins, In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of Jehovah unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edu, the prophet, saying, I'm going to stop there. I'm not going to start into the prophets yet, the prophecy until next week. Now, this book has, like all the Bible, has chronological identifiers. The Bible wants us to know exactly when things happened, who wrote things. They want to give us people groups. The Bible wants us to know times, places, and people. Um, this is not fanciful literature designed to um, just kind of entice us about future events. The Bible is very, very clear. Now, I'm putting in these dates here, but they didn't have those kinds of dates during this time. They had to identify things with who was reigning, what city was where, who was in control, and so on. Now, this particular reign of Darius I has a couple of different pieces of information. It lets us know that this happened after the Babylonian exile. So it was after the Medes and the Persians took over. And it also is a reference, an implied reference, to what the Lord Jesus talked about in his Olivet Discourse about the times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles. This prophecy is being given in the second stage of the times of the Gentile. Now Darius the Great, as he was called, was an Archimedid prince. It just means that he was from the Persian line, Old Persia, Archimedid. And that name comes from the guy that founded Persia. That was his name. Um, He's prominently mentioned, mentioned here in, and, in, and in Haggai, as well as what I mentioned in the book of Daniel. He recorded his victories on a stone. Uh, it's like a little mountain wall. You know, if, if, if you've ever been um, up in uh, South Dakota and seen the carvings of the presidents, you know, in the rock. Well, this is something quite similar. Quite similar. He had this carved, and I got a picture of that in your notes. What's hard to see is the inscriptions, because I'd have to blow the picture up about this big in order to see the inscriptions. But this is an extremely important archaeological find. Uh, it's located in uh, Kerman Shah. It's a province of Iran. And um, what is significant about this is his... Uh, conquests were written in three different languages. So it's sort of like the Rosetta Stone for this form of language. It's, uh, you know, the Rosetta Stone enabled uh, linguists to translate the um, Egyptian hieroglyphics. And what this allowed is these dead languages to be translated because there was Babylonian here. And... Uh, it allowed people to understand what these old languages were. Now, following the chronological setting to give us an idea when this stuff happened, there's a reference to his father and his grandfather. Now, both his grandfather and his father were priests, but they leave off any discussion of Edo 
his father and then just turned to his grandfather, Berchiah, and probably because his father died young. The Hebrew word for father is av, A-V, and it also means grandfather, and it also means uh, any ancestor, av. So you've got to look at the context when you're looking at the Hebrew here to understand who they're talking about. He returned from Babylon, and we know that his father died young, and um, he was uh, a prophet by getting these prophecies, and he was also a priest, so he must have been about 30 years old when this stuff was written, because in order to be a priest in the Mosaic economy, you had to be 30 years old. Um, he started prophesying only two months uh, later than Haggai, and, but they were both encouraging the rebuilding of the temple, the rebuilding of the city, and, and repentance. Repentance for Israel. There was a reason that they went into captivity. You know, it wasn't just happenstance that this occurred. The Lord has taken down empires because of the way they treat him. And, you know, we, we can look at the United States and say the same thing's going to happen here. The same thing's going to happen here. We've turned away from God, and there are plenty of forces that are trying to pull us away from him now. I mean, there's rampant homosexuality. There's rampant abortion crime. Um, you know, all the mainline denominations have caved in. Hardly any of them even know what the Bible looks like. And they don't teach the Bible. Uh, we have pulled away from God and, and our demise is imminent. It happened here. It happened in every other world empire and there's no reason to think it can't happen right now in this country. We've lasted quite a while, you know, as an empire now. If you think back to 1776, I mean, we're 240 years or so. And that's uh, relatively long compared to these other world empires. And in our next session, I'm going to go over a detailed list of who all these rulers were in these empires. And you can see the dates and the rulers, you know, what time the prophecies were given. And we'll look at each one of these guys and you see how long they last. And it's all dependent on whether or not they love God. <laughs> That's what it's dependent on. God wants to show us through these prophecies that he is in control of world events. Things don't just happen. God causes them to happen. It's just way beyond our understanding how he does it. And I don't profess to be able to understand how he does it. I just know he does it and I know he's in control. But both Haggai and Zechariah were prophesying about the return and prophesying about repentance for Israel. Now, um, he was still pretty young because we get a uh, message here in Zechariah 2.8, a Hanar Halaz, the young man, Hanar Halaz, the young man. And here he is referring to himself because he's writing the book. Now, the Jews were in Babylon for 70 years when they were given the authorization to go home under Cyrus. And Zechariah was one of the guys that took advantage of this, and he, he was going back. Um, he died in Jerusalem uh, at an advanced age. He was buried next to Haggai. And the prophecies that he got, as I mentioned a few moments ago, went all the way out, yet future to us. And he talked about the second coming. Now the, the Old Testament prophecies of the second coming of Christ are mingled together with the first coming. So that was what caused these guys some confusion when Christ appeared the first time, because they just didn't understand how, here's the Messiah, and somebody's killing him? I don't get it. He comes first as a suffering servant, and then he comes back as the king, taking his kingdom. There are plenty of references to the Lord Jesus in this book as we move through it. And um, 
predictions that Christ made about the times of the Gentiles, I think, are really important for us to understand. So I want to spend the rest of our time this morning talking about what the times of the Gentiles are, and then I'll uh, conclude that next week. It, it, it should be a proper introduction to this book and the book of Revelation, because they're explicitly laid out here, and the chart that I'm going to give you next week, as I'd mentioned, is going to have everybody that's been one of the rulers in these empires, and, and the dates that they ruled, and who succeeded them. But, you know, I remember I looked at this when I first looked at it and thought to myself, well, why is this important? Who cares? Who cares who was there before? And who cares who is going to be in future, uh, uh, you know, to us? Because the Lord Jesus said it was important. He said it was important so, one, we would not be deceived by the times that we live in. So we would understand exactly where we fit in in all of human history. And we can easily see by looking at what the Bible teaches about the times of the Gentiles that it validates the authenticity of the Bible. The more you know in the Bible, the more real it becomes. Because it's tied to specific human events, specific governments, specific people, specific places. God wants us to know what he said, and he wants us to understand it and believe it. He doesn't want to just throw out a bunch of commandments. Here, do this. And I know most churches teach that today. Just Here, just do these things. That's all you need to know. Um, you'll never get that sense of belonging, and you'll never get that sense of identifying with this unless you read the whole thing and understand the whole thing, because that's when we get that deep, rich understanding that, hey, this is real. This is not just a clever set of ideas here somebody put together. It's real. God superintended the writing of these scriptures, where you got 66 books written by 40 authors over a period of almost 2,000 years that all testify to the same story and the same God. All of them. What the Lord was referring to when he said the times of the Gentiles, and he made that reference in his Olivet Discourse, and we read that in Luke 16 and Matthew 24 and 25, what he was saying was that the Gentiles are going to control Jerusalem until he returned. This is what he said about the trampling of Jerusalem in Luke 21, 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. <laughs> you know, when we were walking around the old city of Jerusalem just a few weeks ago, I kept thinking of that. Wow, look how many... Gentile governments have controlled this and have wanted it so bad. And look at the wars that have taken place here and how many people are trying to destroy it even now because it's God's real estate. It belongs to God. You know, Jerusalem doesn't have any natural wonders. It doesn't have any um, oil or gold or silver or nothing. And you got massive numbers of people that are fighting for control of that city. It's in the news every day, and Israel is one of the teeniest little countries in the world because God owns it. And it's the spiritual war that's taking place that gets acted out right there. And I'll tell you, the pinpoint of that is the Temple Mount. You go to the Temple Mount, and it is stressful. Uh, you have a very limited number of activities that you can perform there, times you can go. And uh, the Islamists control it, and the Jews are there with their machine guns watching what happens. <laughs> it, this is God's real estate. God owns it. During this Olivet Discourse, the inner circle of the apostles, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, were sitting on the Mount of Olives, which is on the east side of the Temple Mount. And then the Kidron Valley is there which in biblical times was called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And they were looking back at this massive structure of the temple. And they were saying, wow, isn't that cool? Look at the temple, Lord. Look at it. And that was the center of life back then. 
And he starts talking about it being destroyed. And they said, what? He said, yep, one stone is not going to be left on another. And it was destroyed by Titus Vespasian, the Roman general, in 70 AD after a Jewish insurrection that started four years earlier. But they were asking him questions as a result of him making that statement about, oh, when are you coming back? Because they, they knew he was going to come back because he talked about it. And, and what, what's the earth going to be like when you come back? I mean, what, what, what's going to be happening? And one of the things that he said was that Jerusalem is going to be trodden down until the times of the Gentiles were completed or fulfilled. Meaning that the Gentiles were only going to have control for Jeru over Jerusalem for some period of time. And he wanted to warn them about this and warn them about the deception. And just like he said in Matthew 24, 25, he does not want us to be deceived. He wants us to know what these things are. Hosea 4, 6 tells us that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they've rejected knowledge. They push Christ away. They push God away. We don't need him. You see that today. God has no part in this. God had, you know, you can't bring God into that and so on. And you see that in the news all the time. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's exactly what happens when people push God away. There's a destruction that is imminent. Therefore, when you do that, you're going to be deceived because you're going to believe every wind of doctrine that comes along. You say, well, I don't know what to believe. I, you know, we've been told that the Bible's not true and that's not accurate. Uh, and then I have to ask, well, did you look for yourself? Did you study it yourself? Well, no, I'm not going to do that. That's what most people say. Oh, okay. How would you know then? Well, you know, that newspaper said and the school said we can't teach the Bible and, you know, everybody's throwing it out, so they must be right. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You know, most people think that the world events that happen, the treaties, the circumstances, uh, political changes are just all chance. They just don't think that God is causing all these events to happen. Now, the times of the Gentiles is a very long period of time. It starts with the Babylonian captivity and it ends with the second coming of Christ. That is what he talked about being the times of the Gentiles. There have been a few periods, including now, when the Jews have had temporary control over Jerusalem. Hasn't been permanent. First one was the Maccabean period when uh, the Maccabean family, Judas Maccabeus and his brothers and his dad, threw off the yoke of the successors of Alexander in the Hellenistic Empire. The Hellenistic Empire was the third empire in the times of the Gentile. And Antiochus Epiphanes IV was in Jerusalem and he was just an absolute despot and the Lord raised up the uh, Maccabees and they threw them off but they were only in control of Jerusalem from 164 BC until 63 BC. Then there was a Jewish revolt against Rome and that started in 66 AD and it ended in 70 AD as it was short-lived too and as I've mentioned that's when Titus Vespasian just leveled the uh, Jewish temple and he didn't want it destroyed, but um, they, somebody burned it and all the gold that was inside, it melted into the crevices between the stones and the Roman soldiers took all the stones apart to get to the gold. Just like Christ said, one stone is not going to be left on another. Then there was a second Jewish revolt between 132 and 135 AD. There's a guy named Simon Bar Kokhba that uh, the unbelieving Jews believed he was the Messiah and of course Christ said there's going to be a lot of false messiahs that are going to come after me and this was the first one probably the biggest and most well known 
And uh, he was followed by thousands of people, and so they tried to have a revolt against the Romans that were controlling them. And for about three and a half years, they grabbed control of Jerusalem. But the Romans crushed them. Hadrian, the Roman general, and ultimately another Caesar, he uh, crushed them. So um, they had control for a very, very short time. And then now, today, since the 1967 war, they've had control of Jerusalem. That's going to be short-lived, too. Because in the middle of the Great Tribulation, the Antichrist is going to take it back. The abomination of desolation is going to be set up in the Holy of Holies, which is an image, like a puppet, a Pinocchio, if you will, of the Antichrist is going to be set up in the Holy of Holies. Satan will cause that puppet to come alive in the Holy of Holies. And the Antichrist is going to declare himself God and mandate Antichrist worship or whatever his name is. We don't, I mean, Antichrist is just a euphemism. <clears throat> he's been given a hundred names in the Old Testament, but we, we don't know what his actual name is going to be. We just know he's going to be a leader of the world in the one world government. So they've had temporary control. And in order for us to understand the times of the Gentiles, we've got to look at Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, and Daniel chapter 11. And I just want to look at uh, chapter 2 today. There was an image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, saw. And it, it was in a dream, and it really bothered him. And so he went to his soothsayers, his prophets, if you will, and they're false prophets. And he said, hey, I had this dream. Uh, tell, me, tell me what it is that I, uh, you know, about this dream. And they said, yeah, sure. Uh, well, what did you see? And they said, uh, no. You tell me what I saw, and then you tell me what it means. If you guys are that good. And they all wilted. They couldn't do it. <laughs> so he obviously, you know, calls their bluff and knows that they're not very good. Somebody tells him about one of the kids that was taken from Israel in 605 B.C. that has a special relationship with God, and let's use him. So they called Daniel, and here's what Daniel says in chapter 2, verses 31 to 35. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee. And in the form thereof was terrible, the image's head was of fine gold, and his breast, and his arms of silver, and his belly, and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet, part of iron, and part of clay. Thou sawest, it's in the dream, till that a stone was cut without hands, that means it wasn't made with human hands, that smote the image upon the feet that were of iron, and clay, and break them in pieces. Then was the iron and the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now the prophecy is just loaded with information about these world empires. It's a general description that's given here that's got a lot of specificity. Now the, the image is described as having a head of gold and breast and arms of silver. The breast and the arms, there's two different arms and they're made of silver. The belly and the thighs of brass. Legs of iron, two segments that are iron ending with feet and toes of part iron and part clay. We got ten toes. So you got one, two, one, two, and ten. Now the metals have great importance. They increase in strength and specific gravity as they move from the description of the head to the toes. And they decrease in value. I mean, think through this now. They increase in strength and they decrease in value. So the decrease is showing a decrease of authority of the ruler. 
as it goes through the successive generations. Babylon is the absolute monarchy, the head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar had complete fiat control of anything and everything that happened. It didn't matter who wanted to do what or what laws had been in place. He could do anything he wanted to. He could break the laws of the land if he wanted to because he made them. He could do anything. As we move down the image, we see that the breast and the arms of silver, now there's two arms, Medo-Persia. They came together as one empire, but they were two. They have a um, different specific gravity, less value, and they're stronger. Darius was not above the law. We see this in the story about Daniel and lion's den. Darius made a law, but he couldn't violate it. Even the monarch was not above the law. That changes as we move down. And the Hellenistic king, well, it started with one, Alexander, and then it morphed into many of them, but through a whole series of civil wars, they ended up with four, sometimes five, uh, rulers of the Hellenistic or the Greek Empire. And they ruled by force and graft, personal gifts, if you will, just force, absolute force. They couldn't get anybody to follow them, but they just imposed what they did on others. And finally, the Romans uh, started with one unit split into two, and then as this tells us, splits into ten. Hasn't done that yet. Hasn't done that yet. There was a decrease of character and authority as we moved down and an increase of the strength one over another until finally a stone strikes at the image, hits it on the ten toes, and destroys the image. And the stone is made without hands. It's a supernatural stone. The image is destroyed the stone becomes a great mountain and it fills the whole earth. So the whole earth now is under the control of the stone. That emphasizes, the stone cut without hand emphasizes the divine origin of this stone. It is Christ who is described in the scriptures as the rock, the stone, all over the place. And I've just put a few references down. Luke 6.48, Romans 9.33, 1 Corinthians 10.4. There's a bunch of Old Testament references. He's described as the rock, the stone. Now, Daniel then gives Nebuchadnezzar an interpretation, which is even more detail than I just gave you. And... He says, this is from verse 36 in chapter 2 to verse 45. He says, this is the dream and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art king of kings, unto whom the God of heaven hath given the kingdom of power and the strength and the glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, hath been given into thy hand, and hath made thee to rule over them all. Thou art the head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that crusheth all these, shall it break in pieces and crush. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, but there shall be in it of the strength of iron. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron, 
and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron doth not mingle with clay. And in the days of those kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall the sovereignty thereof be left to another people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. So he's telling him is exactly what's going to happen. Now I put a picture of the image, or somebody's just, you know, <clears throat> an artist's creation of the image, and you can see how the different components, the metallic components of this image, translate out to the particular world empires. Finally ending with Christ's kingdom. Now after he hears this, after uh, the interpretation, Daniel start, or I mean, after the, uh, the this is the interpretation, and he describes it. Um, we see that Babylon was the first empire to dominate Jerusalem. The actual grant given to Nebuchadnezzar included the whole earth, because it states it in this um, this part of Daniel. And it also states it in Jeremiah 27, 5 to 8, and Ezekiel 26, verses 7 to 14. But he didn't take advantage of that. But he, the grant was given to him over the whole earth. Now the two arms of silver, united into the breast of silver, represents the Medes and the Persians. But it lacked the inner unity because even though they had two people groups here, they were never really united. They were two people groups that came together, but they, were, they came together through a conquering by an army, not because people wanted to be together. Um, and as I mentioned before, the government made the mistakes of not having the ruler in this sort of a government entity be in complete control. Darius was not above the law. He made a law. And then his satraps had come to him to try and fool him because they didn't like Daniel. And he had to adhere to the law. So they put him in the lion's den. And you know the story that God preserved him. So he was not above the law. The belly and the two thighs of brass uh, became known as the Hellenistic or the Greek Empire. And that followed Media Persia and it was Alexander that did the conquering. He was the son of um, a Macedonian king that had nowhere near the conquering capabilities of Alexander. I mean, he was incredible, just leopard-like swiftness. He conquered uh, Europe, Northern Africa, and on into Asia. The two thighs... Uh, probably represents Syria and Egypt, which arose out of this. And the grant was the same as Babylon. It was given to the whole world, but they didn't choose to exercise it. Alexander went east and he went west. He went both ways. He had a lot of generals. There were 50-some generals in his army at the time he died. And... Uh, he set up the Hellenistic culture over all of that area. Probably should have put a map in there. I'll put one in next week for you. Of his empire. Because by setting up that Hellenistic culture, putting libraries in, he put a library in Alexandria, Egypt. It was just phenomenal. Had more books in, at that time than any place else in the world. And he forced everybody to speak and read and learn Greek. And that's what the New Testament was written in. So at the time of Christ, when they were writing about Christ, it just spread quickly because everybody could read it. Everybody could read it. But they didn't have a, um, a dynastic rule, if you will, 
In other words, there wasn't any mandate for Alexander to rule. He just conquered. He just grabbed everything he could. And there was no, just no divine rule, no legal succession to his rule. He simply just said, uh, hey, just give it to the strong when he died. And he died in his early 30s. He was really a young guy. He died in Babylon, of all places. And in his early 30s, and uh, they were asking him on his deathbed, well, what, <laughs> did you pick anybody to succeed you? He said, nah, just let them fight it out. Give it to the strong. So these 50-some generals all fought and ended up with four of them. And it took a long time, too. It just didn't happen in a year or two. They fought for a long time. But I want to look at that last image, the legs and the toes. That re represents the fourth Gentile empire, which is still in effect today. And um, it goes through several stages, and I'm going to have additional stages that we'll look at next week. There's the United Stage, and that was the Roman Caesars. And then it gives way to the two division stage. That's the legs. And the legs in the two division stage represent the Roman Empire splitting in 271 under Valentinian. It split. And there was an east and there was a west. And even the standing church at the time, the Roman Catholic Church, stayed in the West, and the Eastern Orthodox Church went to the East. <clears throat> very, very similar theology and uh, complete control, along with the, uh, the princes, if you will, of the civilization at the time. Now, eventually, this fourth empire is going to give way to a one-world government. And that one-world government is going to have ten individual Entities, either economic or political, you know, geographic. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how it's going to be. The Bible doesn't teach that. It just says there's going to be ten individual entities, and it's going to be partially weak and partially strong. It's a lack of cohesiveness between these entities. Because what we're going to see next week is there's this guy called the Antichrist that's going to rise up out of these ten as the eleventh. And he's going to kill three of the kings over these ten groups, and he's going to control the whole thing. They never do come together, but he rules them with an iron hand. So it's an uh, empire that has unique characteristics. It's not going to be cohesive, and it's not the Romans. The Romans started what we call imperialism today, which is an entirely different form of government than the conquerors before them. And that's what the Romans set up, imperialism, and that's what the Western democracies are today. They're imperialistic forms of government. So all of these other ones are going to be destroyed, but they don't leave the earth. They just lose their power. They stay on the earth. It's just their power as world empire ceases. Then this stone comes. This stone that is supernatural. Now a stone or rock, as I said, always represents Christ or the second person of the Trinity. And he crushes this last world empire. Look what 1 Corinthians 10.4 says, And all did drink of the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Christ is the cornerstone. He's going to eliminate the last segment of this, this imperialistic form of government, the fourth Gentile empire, and he's going to set up his own kingdom. And we know from the book of Revelation that this kingdom is going to last a thousand years. And there's huge discussions of this in Jeremiah, and Isaiah, and we'll see a little bit here in Zechariah, there's uh, prominent symbols here that they're used, and they're always used symbolically. <clears throat> the stone represents the second person of the Trinity, and the word mountain is always a symbolic representation of a king, a kingdom, or a throne. So following the fourth Gentile world empire, 
the Lord sets up his government. And Isaiah tells us that the government will be upon his shoulders. Christ is going to set up a government here on the earth at the destruction of the world empire that is in existence today, at least in the Western democracies, called imperialism. The mountain takes over the whole world, and it's not through evangelism by the Christian church. It's going to be through the Great Tribulation and the evangelism of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Christ is going to take control of the earth. Now, with God in Christ sitting on David's throne in Jerusalem, this new government is going to be set up. It's going to be a theocracy. Christ is going to rule it. And I'll give you some charts showing you what the world government structure looks like. We get from the book of Isaiah. He's going to be a real king. A real king. It's going to bring an end completely to Gentile domination of Jerusalem. And the world headquarters are going to be in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is going to be the highest mountain in the world. And there's going to be peace and security and safety. And all the competitive angst in the world, even between um, the different animal groups and men and animals, is going to be gone. It's going to be an entirely different way of doing business, if you will. It's going to be a theocracy. theocracy. It's going to last a thousand years. So just to summarize what we've done today here, the times of the Gentiles, it's a long period of time, one empire followed by another one that ends up with what we have today. It's imperialism. And while these Gentile empires are all of human origin, the last one that gets set up is of godly origin where Christ comes to rule on this earth. Now here's an outline that I've put in your notes in the last page there. It started with the Babylonian Empire in 605 B.C., the Medo-Persian Empire then took them over. The Hellenistic or the Greek Empire took them over. And then the imperialistic form, starting with the Romans, it had a united stage under the Caesars. And then there was a two-division stage I'll talk about next week after Valentinian. And then yet future to us is the ten-division stage and then finally the Messianic Kingdom. Shall we pray? We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, an author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the Dean of the Jewish Studies School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a Hebrew College in Massachusetts. Please write us at Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Again, that's Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Or call us at 877-706-2479. That's 877-706-2479. Once again, 877-706-2479. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you.